I'm John Golia. And I'm Greg Fife. And we are the, the Flight Safety, Safety Detectives. Detectives. We're just two guys who have spent most of their career with the National Transportation Safety Board investigating aircraft disasters and aviation safety issues all over the world. Yep, and this podcast is where we talk about everything from accidents, airplane technology, to the big business of aviation. We live and breathe aviation. My co-host, John, has been in the aviation business for more than 60 years. He was the first and only airframe and power plant mechanic to get a presidential appointment to the National Transportation Safety Board. And Greg is a former air safety investigator and go team captain for the NTSB. He's investigated everything that flies worldwide since he started his career 40 years ago. And on top of that, he is a living legend of aviation inductee. So between John and myself, we have over 100 years of aviation safety experience. It's time to buckle up because it's going to be wheels up. Let's get this show in the air. Well, hello, my friend. How are you, Mr. Flight Safety Detective? I'm at home doing super sleuth stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, being the super sleuth of uh, of aviation safety, are you? Yep, checking out who's been going in the. Re- I've been checking out who's been going in the refrigerator and emptying it. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that you're using those investigative talents for something very productive. Yeah, right. Well, it it is getting uh, it is getting frustrating not being able to go out and do our jobs. I go back on travel. I've got a lot of travel coming up just because uh, I've got to start doing it. I've got a number of trips. And so, you know, there's always that question of being safe and getting the job done at the same time and finding that delicate balance. And so we're going to be back in the mix, or at least I am for sure. So, but uh, what's uh, what's your plan? I mean, um, are you on travel at all? I mean, you get to experience all of these airlines and all of the issues and all of the discussions and especially the discussions you and I, you and I have had about when you put the oxygen mask on in the airplane, do you put it, the mask on over your face or do you take your other mask off and put the, the oxygen mask on? You know, I was playing with one. I have a, a passenger mask, one of those yellow ones, and I was playing with it with my N95 and my disposable surgical type mask, the blue ones, you know, that you covers half your face. And they don't fit very well over either one of them. They don't. And and the other big problem, John, is that because it isn't a pressurized mask, you can't force the air through the density of like an N95 mask or some of these cloth masks. Pa- passengers, you know, even if they tried to force fit it over their current mask, aren't going to be able to breathe anything because it's not forced through the mask. You, you have to inhale very hard. And, and I just think that that's going to be a major issue. And again, as you and I have talked about it, I haven't seen it addressed and I'm going to check it again since I'm on travel again this week. You, you can do it, but you have to be thinking of it through the surgical mask, just a, the double or triple layer of some thin material, but you really have to, suck it suck your air in it's not uh, it's not easy you're not going to put it on and forget about it you have to consciously draw in a big draft of air and the n95 wasn't doesn't do it doesn't seem like it's doing it at all and if you don't educate people that that's the case they're not going to know any different and again you know if the adult doesn't know it the child isn't going to know it if, in fact, they have to put that mask on. So I think that uh, hopefully our call to action, if it hasn't been heated, will be heated because I think that that is critical in enhancing safety now in this new COVID-19 time where we are going to be wearing masks on airplanes for quite a while. So it's going to be real interesting. It is. It is. And one has to wonder, where is the FAA in the Department of Transportation in all of this. I mean, the airlines have been calling for DO2 to step up and address the mask issue, which they haven't done yet, to make it mandatory for everybody to wear it. But when they do that, I hope they don't have uh, leave us with unintended consequences and not address what to do in the, can- in the event of an emergency with your mask. Yeah. And again, the other thing that kind of concerns me is the fact that some people may have a false sense of security. So now we have a smoke event 
in an aircraft, they think, well, if they got that mask on, they're filtering stuff and they, they really aren't. So I think that, you know, you and I think, you know, we're looking far down the road. We're looking at the potential for, yeah, well, here's the, you know, the immediate solution. However, what unintended consequences or what other problems? And I preach it all the time when I'm out giving safety presentations. Yeah, we fixed the immediate problem, but we created three problems down the road that nobody's factored in. And and I, I just hate to get into either a cycle or a sense of, of complacency because, ah, we've got this covered. You know, we're going to uh, protect people by making them wear a mask. Yeah, but it's created other issues that nobody has addressed or um, hasn't thought to address. So, and, you know, speaking of, of those things, you know, in the past couple of weeks, again, you know, they, they love to draw Boeing into the mix for whatever reason. And of course uh, you and I have both read about uh, the 737s, not the max. But the 737 NG, which is the new generation, and the classics that are coming back into service with those airlines that had to park them because of COVID-19, all of a sudden now they've kind of blown up this issue with uh, the bleed valves on the engines that are having problems that are causing in-flight shutdowns on the aircraft. And, And I just wanted you, since you deal with this kind of stuff all the time, Let's talk about, you know, exactly what it is, because the way it's presented, John, um, it drives me nuts because it's, you know, not only, oh, it's another problem with a Boeing, but the way it's presented is, oh, my God, this is a big safety issue. It's another black eye for the 737. And really has nothing to do with the 737, like you said. All right. So the issue is sticking bleed valves after the airplane is left sitting in uh, various locations, and and it showed up first on the CFM 56 engine that's been on the 737 since the uh, 80s, early 80s. So the engine's been around a long time. The 737-300, the first, the 100 and 200 had, had the same engines that were on the DC-9, which also had bleed valve problems. But uh, this CFM has been on that airplane for a long time. It's also on a number of Airbus products as well. So what maybe people don't realize that there's only a limited number of engines in the aviation, and they get put on various airplanes, product lines, sometimes exclusively, sometimes there's more than one engine used on a product line. But Pratt & Whitney, General Electric, and Rolls-Royce and the French engine manufacturer, the biggest producers of engines for aviation. Because they were used in so many different vehicles, it requires different things. Now, the engine provides power to fly the airplane, but it also provides what we call muscle air, that's power, like an air compressor, to power a lot of things inside the airplane, one of which is cabin pressurization. So when you get in the airplane and take off, as the cabin pressure builds up, that air is being powered by the engines, not necessarily directly into the cabin, but at least providing muscle air for compressors that will put it into the cabin. But in any event, you have to bleed that engine off the engine. and that's In other words, it's just a tap off the engine to take air off of it. It's like your air conditioner in your house. After the air conditioner makes it cold, it goes through a duct and it splits five different ways to go to five different rooms. Well, it's very similar to that in an aircraft for distribution of this compressed air or muscle air. Because you want constant flow of air, you have different pressures in the engine. If you start from the front of the engine, as you start coming backwards, each stage of the compressor has different pressure in it and different temperature. The temperature goes up and the pressure goes up. So if you're flying along at 30,000 feet and you have your your engine at, at, let's say, 65% power, and now you're going to descend, the air traffic control tells you to descend, and you pull the throttle back, well, now suddenly you don't have that muscle air as strong pushing to provide the pressurization in the airplane. So what happens when you throttle back is these bleed valves, and there's a number of them in the engine, and they 
correspond to different levels of pressure inside the engine. So at altitude, you may have been running on the fifth stage bleed on the engine, but as you're coming down, if you need more pressure, the next stage might be 10th stage. That'll start to open up to provide additional muscle air to drive whatever it is you're going to drive. And part of the things that they drive is keeping the wings warm for anti-icing. The leading edge of the airplane is heated with this hot air that comes off the engine. So there's a lot of uses for it. And these bleed valves regulate the pressure inside the airplane because you don't want unrestricted engine bleed air because the pressures can get quite high and also quite hot. So you don't want to get them. I mean, I remember 13 stage air on a JT8D engine, which was the one used on early 727s and DC9s, with something in the neighborhood of 1,400 degrees centigrade, which is probably 18 or 1,900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. You don't want that running around inside the airplane or even inside your wing. So there's, there's ways they modulate that to keep it cooler. So it's a very complicated system, and these bleed valves have to be very free to open and close and apparently what's happening today is these airplanes that were put down for storage, and because we ran out of room in the deserts, they've been stored in a lot of places that normally they wouldn't have. I mean, I just saw a picture of 80 or 90 airplanes stored in Pittsburgh, which is not exactly free from humidity. So those airplanes would have to be looked at rather closely when they come back in the service. Now, when you and I were out to Seattle, GE was out there. And they talked about what they needed to do to those same engines, the, this engine that we're talking about, the AD's talking about, the FAA, what they were going to do to those engines. And they were very specific and they were very conscious of the fact about bleed, bleed valves sticking. I talked to them about that after the presentation, actually. And apparently what's happened was the airlines were following the script that GE presented for the 737 MAX engines, but apparently some of these earlier 737s were parked and they didn't follow the same script. Well, probably because there wasn't a script written for them. It's just what's in the maintenance manual that, that probably hasn't addressed adequately storage. But in any event, they were stored. These bleed valves picked up some contaminants and maybe some corrosion and they start to stick. And the concern is today, because we have 95% of the fleet has two engines. You can't be having one engine failure on an airplane and worried about the other one. Yeah, especially during critical phases of flight and the return to service. You know, the thing that concerns me, and again, you know, you and I have touched on this in, in previous shows, and that is while here in the United States and, and elsewhere, you know, the maintenance is very good, we've questioned some of the maintenance practices around the world. Recently, we talked about Pakistan with their pilots and possibly their maintenance folks, as well as Indonesia and other places. You know, and as these airlines around the world bring these airplanes back online, these are the types of issues that can be very easily overlooked by them, if not ignored. And all of a sudden now, you start creating issues, you create an indictment of an airplane again, where this particular issue is not an airframe issue. Boeing does not make this engine. Airbus does not make this engine. And yet, because it's strapped to a Boeing or an Airbus or any other airplane, the moniker of Boeing gets rammed. <laughs> and and it's, you know, it's the confusion. It's that misinformation that we're always talking about when we're talking about the facts, conditions, and circumstances. And so I think for the flying public, from my standpoint, is it's it's great that the FAA is taking this immediate action right now and requiring operators, Boeing, to to you know assist in uh, in checking this with the airlines. I mean, this is a very proactive and preventative thing that's taking place. We're not waiting for an accident or serious incident to happen before action is being taken. That's true. But you know what? As you were talking, I was I was thinking, I would love the good old days. And the good old days, I mean the days that we had the 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 Hagers and the and the Bobos 
and Don Phillips, all, all of those people, for those who don't know the names, were reporters that covered aviation, uh, mostly out of Washington, D.C., and they knew what they were talking about. And today I get so frustrated when I read articles by reporters, and it's obvious after the first two sentences that they don't know what the hell they're talking about, and it's just filling the page up with words with no real meaning. You know, one of the things that I always believed is the press can drive positive change. If the press does a very accurate story and points out the deficiencies, it sort of nudges along the bureaucracy to fix the problems. But when the story is full of crap, they just ignore it and keep on going, and we don't get the positive results from events that we could get because the press doesn't do their job the way they used to. And that's why I harp so much over the past year and a half with regard to 737 MAX accidents and the disservice that was done through the press in mischaracterizing a lot of information about the MAX, the misunderstandings, the misinformation about the MCAS system, its application, pilots' responsibilities. And it's just frustrating because it's a disservice to the flying public and to the, the, the professionals that are flying those aircraft who all of a sudden now there's this big fear factor built in when in fact it's an airplane and pilots are trained to fly airplanes. And if you have a system, a system that you can turn off, which you can turn off the MCAS just like any other system on the airplane, you become that pilot and fly the airplane. And, and there was just so much information and, and you and I used you know, the official investigative information and Lion Air to disprove what had been wildly published as a sexy story in the, in the collusion between the feds and the manufacturer and all the airlines and everybody else. And it's just, it just drives me nuts because you and I live in this fact world and we talk about all of the events from a factual basis and we provide at least our commentary based on our experience of those facts. We aren't coming up with wild emotional stories. We're coming up with fact, and it's just, it is very frustrating. So the bottom line here is that for the folks that are listening to our show, it is safe to get on an airplane that has this engine on it and these bleed valve issues, because this is a byproduct of the airplane sitting on the ground. I mean, we had to park airplanes all over the world, just like leaving your car sitting for months on end, things break and that should be expected. And no matter what you do to inspect it before you drive it, there is usually going to be something that breaks. That's just the nature of a machine. And so from that particular standpoint, I think that the the problem is going to be corrected. These airplanes are going to be to be returned to service. There won't be any other issues. And in fact, if there is an issue, the two people sitting up front in that aircraft are trained to handle those issues. So there shouldn't be a fear to get on an airplane, whether it's an Airbus, a Boeing, or anything else that has these engines on it. This is my segue into what we're going to talk about today because we're focusing on a maintenance issue that we just talked about. But you were intimately involved in an accident back in 2003 involving a Beach 1900 regional aircraft that had crashed down in North Carolina. And um, there were a couple of issues, major issues, not only with regard to uh, the operation of the aircraft by the flight crew, but the primary issue was before the flight ever took off, and that was due to maintenance. And I think it's a, an interesting story, John, because, again, we are always questioning, and we talked about it in a previous show with Atlas Air, where what came under fire was the qualifications, capabilities, and experience of the two flight crew members on that Boeing 767. They were both very deficient pilots, a system that had come into play years ago called the Pilot Record Improvement Act, where it would be incumbent upon air carriers or employers to be able to run very thorough background checks 
on pilots from previous employers to see whether they met qualifications, did they have any serious deficiencies that would prevent them from having an employment opportunity. One of these issues, of course, was you know, whether or not the flight crew in this particular instance, this Beach 1900, were they properly qualified, were they properly experienced to fly the airplane, but then you and I are going to take it one step further. So I think to kick that off, since you have a lot of knowledge about it, this was uh, this was one of those issues where the airplane had been in for maintenance a couple of nights before the accident. It had already flown several revenue flights without incident, but on this particular accident flight, things started to develop both with the baggage weights and the flight crew calculating a critical component, which is the weight and balance and center of gravity, but also then an unbeknownst to them maintenance issue. So I'll turn it over to you and why don't you just talk about, you know, some of the maintenance history that took place those two nights before. This airplane went in for a rather routine maintenance visit and it's an all night job. The airplane came in about 10 o'clock at night or the, the people that worked on it came in about 10 o'clock at night and they worked through the night. There was a half a dozen mechanics and one inspector. The inspector had a lot of experience on this particular airplane, but the rest of the crew had less than two months time with the company working on this particular type of airplane. And they, they were very inexperienced to say the least. And this particular night, there was two jobs that were rather technical in nature. One was this elevator rigging check and the other was an engine problem so the inspector who's normally the second set of eyes the guy who's supposed to take an unbiased look at the work that's done to make sure it's done right is now part of the production on those problems because he's telling these individuals what to do he's trying to guide them through the work that has to be done plus keeping tabs on the the other four people that were working on the airplane as well and doing his normal inspection duties the routine inspections that he has to do. So he was busy. This particular mechanic that was working on the airplane, according to his resume, had some experience working on flight control rigging in the past, but in subsequent looking at that, that wasn't as strong as what was stated on the resume. And wasn't it, John, that his, that whatever experience it was, it wasn't on the 1900 per se. You know, everybody, you know, we look at a car and they, well, a car is a car is a car. Well, when it comes to airplanes, an airplane is not an airplane is not an airplane from the standpoint that different mechanical systems, different flight control systems are as you know unique as the airplane that they're on. That's true. And he didn't have any experience to speak of on this 1900. Like I said, he's he was one of the people that had less than two months working on the airplane. He had been furloughed from a major airline where he worked for a few years. So he wasn't uh, loaded with experience to start with. It may have been himself, or it could have been his employer, which was one of these manpower companies that overstated his experience. I don't know for sure whose fault it was, but anyway, his experience was overstated. And the fact remains that he didn't have the experience to do the job that he was doing uh, working alone. He needed more hands-on guidance than what this inspector was able to give him. And consequently, he rigged the airplane a little bit improperly. Now, before we go any further, we got to talk about this airplane. This airplane was originally designed with piston engines on it. And in order not to recertify the whole airplane, when they upgraded it, they limited to upgrades that they performed on the airplane. So then you only have to look at the upgrades and you don't have to recertify the entire airplane. So one of the things that they had done was they put more powerful engines on this airplane. It went to turbine power instead of piston. What that did was made a so-so a airplane into a great airplane because it had so much power to weight ratio. It just was a performing airplane. When you put that into commercial service for the airlines or for cargo carriers, that poses some problems because it has so much power, so much performance. They tend to load them to the maximum. And the airplane flies very well loaded to the maximum, unlike some airplanes. Everybody got used to this airplane being able to carry a full load of passengers and being able to be stuffed full 
with baggage, which was all the way in the back of the airplane. And even myself working on the ramp, I can remember seeing this airplane going out and it looked like it was already climbing for the sky as it taxied by. The nose was so high because the tail was so heavy. And that got to be the norm. And that's one of the things that happened in this accident. The baggage handlers loaded every bit of baggage that they could into that airplane, into the rear of the airplane, and let it take off. Now, I don't remember if it was overgrossed. I don't believe it was overgrossed, but it was pretty heavy in the tail. This airplane was overgrossed. It was? Yeah, by 500, almost 600 pounds. Yeah, well, an airplane that big, that isn't a lot to be overgrossed by, is it? Except depending on where it is. And in this case, it's in the tail. That was the key that the board found at the very end was that it was uh, better than 5% out of the FCG, which those two factors combined with what you're talking about with the maintenance issue was a prescription for the eventual disaster that occurred. Now, that maintenance issue came back and had another effect. We have to assume that he rigged the t cable tension is what the problem was, the cable tension to where it was supposed to be. But what he did when he rigged it was he took out some of the control authority. So when you hold the control column in your hand on the cockpit, a pilot holds it in his hand, if you push it all the way forward, it's going to give you X amount of authority nose down, and you measure that on the tail, deflection of, of the elevators on the tail. And when you pull that yoke all the way back and pull it into your chest as far as you can, it also gives you nose up authority, and you measure that in the same place back on the tail. When he adjusted these cables, he took out some of the nose down authority. This airplane had far more nose up authority than it should have, and far less nose down authority than it needed. So when it took off, and because it was so tail heavy, the nose started to climb, and the pilots pushed the control column forward to bring the nose down. But they couldn't bring it down because it had been trimmed out. It had been taken out by the improper maintenance activity that went on so that they couldn't push the nose over. They didn't have any time to figure out what it was, and the airplane stalled and came right back down. It never even left the airport. Yeah, and in fact, it crashed into a hangar. Yes, right next to the hangar. Well, part of it hit the hangar and hit some work stands that were parked, that was stored right next to the hangar, which made it even worse. And everybody perished. There was a big fire because it was full of fuel, needless to say. And after all the work that was done on scene, that it, this ended up back in the hangar. This accident ended up back in the hangar. And, and despite my best efforts, because I was there for this, I was not able to get the accident staff management of the aviation division to go deeply into this maintenance misadventure. I'll be kind and call it a misadventure into the hangar to identify all the causes and all the events that led up to what happened. You know, unlike what happens when we do a, an accident that involves pilots, the NTSB will put two, three, four people digging in through all the, the factors that impacted upon the person, the pilot doing the work, and identify where the deficiencies were. All too often when we have a maintenance accident, they come up to the hangar doors and say, okay, it was a maintenance accident. It's inside the hangar. See you, See you later. Exterior light. Servo control. Hi. Engine start panel. You bring up a good point, John. And, and you know, because we have always focused, the, the board is, you know, primarily focused on the operations side of an event. And while they do get into maintenance and they do find these maintenance deficiencies, they don't dissect it to the level that you're talking about and and when you look at it maintenance is just as safety critical position as operations i mean if you don't fix it right i can't fly it right yes the big problem is how many issues have we i won't say ignored but glossed over or really not developed that could provide further improvement to the ground side of the overall operation of the aircraft, that is the maintenance side, making sure that that airplane is fit to fly, good to go, airworthy to conduct the mission. And, you know, in this particular instance, the point that you made with regard to 
the fact that you have these manpower companies that because the airlines are contracting out to these folks, they don't have the resources on staff, budgets and everything else. So they contract these services. And while the guy may have a ticket in his pocket that says he is an AMP mechanic and he has some, quote, prior big airplane experience, doesn't necessarily make that person the best qualified to be touching that airplane, even if they can read the maintenance manual. That's more than true. More than true. I mean, it's really, and maintenance manuals are not the best written Today they gotten they've gotten quite good today, but this airplane wasn't today. And and you know the maintenance manuals aren't written by maintenance guys; they're written by freaking engineers, or not even, <laughs> or technical report writers that have no aviation background. When I get on my high horse and go after the manufacturers for their manuals, one of the things I like to point out is pick an airplane: seven hundred seven, seven twenty, seven twenty seven, seven six seven, five seven. Where do you think those manuals were written? I have no idea. All right. The airplanes were built in Seattle. The manuals were written in Wichita. Huh. Now, the manual has to be ready to go when the first airplane comes off the assembly line. How, where do you think these guys in Wichita got the information to put the manual together? The internet. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's the drawings for yeah. the airplane. Yeah. Sometimes the drawings don't agree with... Engineering drawings don't always agree with production drawings because there's engineers on the assembly line that change those drawings as they go on to, for manufacturing ease. Right? It's gotten a little better with, with uh, the, the new computer-aided design tools. But back in the day, they were horrible. I can't tell you how many problems we had with new airplanes with the maintenance manuals that come along. Maintenance would find workarounds. We always would get mechanics in trouble because the FAA would come in after the fact when something happened, something broke, and they found it. The FAA found it. And they'd come back in and say, well, you didn't follow the manual. Well, you can't follow the manual, but that wasn't an excuse. Yeah. And you mentioned this word workaround where, you know, once the airplane comes into service and the guys who are actually working on it find either more efficient ways to fix something or find that the manual isn't the most proper way to fix a problem or even fix the problem at all. It doesn't address it um, as they're seeing it. And, and those things lead to changes. And I know that you were involved in, in an accident with Continental Airlines eons ago where they were trying to find a more efficient way, uh, I'm sorry, uh, American Airlines, trying to do a more efficient engine change on a DC-10, which led to a catastrophic loss of the engine off the airplane in Chicago that led to a disaster. And while from my standpoint and all the experience that you and I have had together doing an accident investigation, the consequences of the best intended actions, these guys are trying to be more efficient, they're trying to do things right, and unfortunately, things end up in a, in a smoking hole because something went awry, the procedure wasn't actually followed, or the people that were executing that procedure weren't the best people to execute the procedure. Well, on that whole side of the, of the maintenance system, you know, engineering drives maintenance, but engineers are under a lot of pressure themselves, times pressure. Oftentimes, they're not in the same location. I mean, the airline I worked for, the engineers were five miles off the airport. It wasn't like that when I started. When they were small, the engineers were right there, and they could go down on the hangar floor and look at the airplane, and, and if you were in a remote location, they could go down and look and see what you're trying to explain to them. That's not the case anymore. And in fact, I think it's about to get even worse because United Airlines chopped they had a huge engineering shop, 600-plus engineers at one time. That's only a shadow of what it used to be. And they're all looking now to make that even smaller by contracting out the engineering services to companies that will provide them for them. And that in itself is not an issue, provided they contract it out to competent organizations. But you have to provide enough management over the work that's being done. And that's the same thing that we had with ValueJet. They sent the airplane in there and nobody was looking. Nobody was taking a look at what the repair station was doing. Well, the same thing has to happen if we're going to contract out the engineering. Somebody's got to take a management 
look at what they're doing. Doesn't mean you have to redo the work, but you have to spot check it and you have to understand who's doing the work. Don't just throw it over the fence, say, oh, I hinted, I sent it to Harry's engineering firm and they're going to send it back when they finish it. Well, they might finish it, but it might not be what you expect. And you bring up a good point there, John, with, with regard to whether or not these are the, the best organizations or the best people. And as I talked about at the beginning of this segment, and that is with the Pilot Record Improvement Act and the fact that because of deficiencies that we found in the skills, abilities, knowledge, and experience of pilots in accidents, and the fact that when they moved from one organization to another, there wasn't a lot of information that was being ferreted out about their history, other than what they may have put on a resume or something. And because of these deficiencies and their deficient operation of the airplane, it led to an accident. So they put PREA in place so that employers could, of course, get a more thorough background. Well, we know that, that pro- there's still a problem there because now they contract the airlines. A lot of times don't do the, the background checks themselves. They don't pick up the phone. There's a contract service that they use. These folks don't know anything about aviation. They gather intel from a previous employer. The previous employer says, yeah, they were okay. They decided to leave. Well, that translates to they're qualified. And next thing you know, they're getting hired. And and Atlas Air was another example of you had two very bad pilots paired together. The first officer being the worst of the two, you know, because of a lot of deficiencies, they ended up losing the airplane. Does PREA apply to the mechanics since that is a safety critical position as well? It does not. It should apply to everybody in key critical jobs. If you have to be drug tested, then you should have your records available for employment. I mean, they test everybody in maintenance at some point for drugs. Why don't we have their records available for other employers? I know some people that were let go because of repeated drugs. Most times there's a, you know, there's a, you get caught doing drugs the first time. Yeah, you go through a treatment program, you keep your job. And then the second time, you, you, there's no second chance. And so I know, personally know, two for sure, I think there's a third that were let go because of the second chance rule. And within a short period of time, they were back working for another aviation company. And with so much contract maintenance, more so than contract pilots especially, you're not going to see air carriers using uh, contract. You see more of that in the charter business and definitely in the corporate world. But where you do have so many contract maintenance organizations, third-party maintenance organizations, you know, the airline doesn't have their own people in El Paso, Texas. They contract to a company. And you don't know what you're getting other than the company saying, I got two guys that are qualified to work on your airplane. Well, that's true, but are they the best qualified guys? Did they have a deficient history that could compromise the safety of your aircraft? And I just think that, you know, they should apply the PREA standard in maintenance because, like I said, if you fix it wrong, I fly it wrong. In my presentations, I I say it so many times that I'm blue in the face, but there is no job in aviation that's unimportant. People think, oh, he throws bags. What's that matter? Well, the guys that threw the bags on this Air Miss West accident that we just talked about, that did matter. They told us that there was a number of them that were very heavy. Didn't that trigger some thought process that maybe they were loading the airplane too heavy? Yep. Yeah, I mean, because weight and balance is so critical. And while, yeah, they're just, you know, they're manual labor, that manual labor is critical to the safe operation of the aircraft. And, you know, all the way down to the people that empty the trash, if you will, there is always a a safety issue involved. And I think we minimize it sometimes. Oh, like you just said. You know, oh, he's just a baggage smasher. He's a, he works on the ramp. That's not a big deal. It is a big deal. You know, catering trucks. How many times have we seen guys who have bumped the side of the airplane with a catering truck, 
they don't think it was an issue. Next thing you know, there's, you know, damage to the fuselage or whatever that can um, erupt into a very safety critical issue with, with the operation of the airplane. So, like you said, nothing is too small in aviation. And I just think that when we look at the operation, we have focused all of our attention on the operation. That is how we fly the airplane, what the what the responsibilities are of the pilots. But again, I just think that in a safety critical position where you need to make sure that when that airplane comes in for maintenance, it goes out in an airworthy condition. It's pristine, ready to go so that I don't have to deal with a problem that I wasn't planning on. Yes, we're not there. We're actually going in the other direction. Where's the FAA in all this, John? Why aren't they seeing this? Why are you and I having to talk about this and possibly even make it a call to action to get somebody to, to move on this? I mean, this isn't rocket science, John. This, I mean, this is logic. And it's not like we have to study the issue. We've studied the issue. We've seen the accidents. This is a reoccurring problem. We saw it with Eagle Lake, Texas. We saw it with a, a number of maintenance-related accidents. And the question is, why isn't anybody moving off dead center? I've asked the same question. When I was at the board, a number of the senior management in the FAA were friends of mine from long before I got there. And you know, I expected more out of them, but there's something institutional in the, in the way the FAA runs in Washington that prevents the maintenance side from getting anything done. Now, I know part of the reason is, uh, for example, human factors. When we, we put some human factors programs together and they went on this list of the FAA and the maintenance issues always were on the third page of the list. And when the budget got passed, it was rare that there was enough money to go past the first page. So although all this work was done, all this effort to identify the problems was done where the FAA could have some impact, and then the system just wouldn't fund it. Then it becomes very frustrating for the FAA inspectors, and how many times do you get slapped in the face before you just throw up your hands and say, you know what, I'll just do my job, and I won't care, and I won't push very hard. And we see that on, you know, we see that on both the pilots and most so on the maintenance side, but we see it. And it's amazing, John, because when you talk about human factors, everything that happens in the cockpit, every single thing that happens in the cockpit when it comes to human factors, whether it's fatigue, decision-making, aeronautical decision-making, some of the physiological effects that pilots experience, everything that happens in the front end of an airplane happens in the hangar, happens to maintenance folks. And, and I just don't understand. And I'm, you know, we've, you and I have bantered this back and forth for years. Why is it that we cannot get these folks to understand? Yeah, they talk about fatigue and the fact that, yeah, the maintenance guys are, you know, working overnights and then they're working a mid or a day or whatever. Okay, they've touched on it, but they haven't really addressed it yet. Everybody continually beats up pilots for fatigue and duty schedules and, and, um, and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, physiological things. Well, okay. Yeah. A pilot's going to experience spatial disorientation in the airplane. Yeah. Mechanics not going to do that, but mechanics do have health issues. Mechanics do experience these physiological things that can have an adverse effect on their performance to do their job or cognitive thinking issues that pilots experience. Same thing happens in a maintenance hangar. And next thing you know, you got a maintenance guy who has done something where either by attitude, they go, been there, done that. I've done this before a thousand times. I don't need to follow the manual. And next thing you know, they've rigged the aircraft incorrectly and things like that. And I just don't understand why we don't really apply an equal standard to the hangar because of how safety critical those positions are. Yeah, we haven't been able to, you know, and, and on the fatigue issue, I used to ask when we would work in Washington before I came to the board, would work in Washington on the fatigue issues, I would ask the question, said, why does General Motors not assemble their cars on midnight shift? None of the manufacturers in this country assemble products on midnight shift. They do it on a wartime footing. They don't do it normally. Why? Ask the question. I don't know the answer. Ask the question why. And I, you get that blank look in everybody's face. I think they know something we don't know. Maybe they don't want to pay for the quality issues 
because the car got out and it wasn't assembled right or somebody missed something or, you know, whatever the reason, maybe they've got some experience with that and they decide, you know what, we don't need to do it. We'll work two shifts. And we've seen that with pilots, John. I mean, NASA, uh, we had Mark Rosekind who worked on the Guantanamo Bay accident with me. Uh, I was a DC-8 that crashed with a cargo hauler. There's just historical information written at nauseam in aviation about backside of the clock flying. And primarily the cargo haulers are the ones that do the backside of the clock flying, the red eyes and that kind of stuff. And we know that pilot performance has a tendency to degrade because they're getting out of circadian rhythm. Your body is built to work, you know, and be awake during the day and sleep at night and recover. Yet now we're we're going against nature and that in and of itself imposes physiological things that degrade performance. We know that. And while we try to fight through it as a human, because we need to accomplish the mission, again, we still haven't applied that level of knowledge and standard equally because you do have that overnight shift. Why? You got to get that airplane in. You got to get it fixed. You got to get it, you know, inspected, get it, get it back on the line for the 6 a.m. departure. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Well, I, I would just hope that, you know, in, you know, with these accidents and, and the fact that, uh, you know, we continually see, you know, issues of performance across the board, pilots and mechanics, I would just like to see these standards. I mean, we're trying to trap line those people who compromise aviation safety by the performance of their respective job. And, you know, the majority of the pilots out there, the majority of the maintenance folks out there, and flight attendants and anybody else, they're outstanding professionals. But you have those folks that slip through the crack. You have those folks that get into a position that they have no business being in. And while, you know, an employer can't constantly be in every cockpit hawking these guys and gals, they do have a responsibility up front to try and catch them before they make their way into the front end or even under the wing of an airplane. And I just think that, you know, they've got to tighten up the standards of PREA because we're seeing pilots slip through supposedly a robust system to try and catch those folks. I just think from my perspective, and you're, you're the one that's in a better position to, to, you know, at least talk about it. I just think because of what it takes for you to fix that airplane and make sure that it's good for me as a pilot to fly it that's safety critical and like i said if you fixed it wrong i'm gonna fly it wrong yeah i'm very concerned about the guys working on the general aviation airplanes that's a huge issue john they are working alone they oftentimes don't have anybody to check their work i mean i've been there i've done it back when i was younger and i didn't know any better today uh I know it's pretty hard working on an airplane remotely, you know, out in an airfield where you show up with your pickup truck and your toolbox on, on the back of the truck and you're working on somebody's airplane. And now you got an owner that's just a royal pain in the ass going, I want my airplane done. I want my airplane done. And then all of a sudden now, how much shortcutting is happening? You know, am I, are they really inspecting all those turnbuckles and, and control cables for fraying as they run through the tube versus... They look at, you know, look down the empennage with a flashlight going, yeah, I don't see, I don't see, you know, any broom straw on down there. So you're good to go. Next thing you know, the elevator doesn't work and things like that. I think engine issues are even bigger. You know, the, uh, the inspection of an engine, I mean, it is a, a very lengthy, complex process, especially if you have to boroscope the cylinders and things like that. It takes a real critical eye. You know, you stick a boroscope in there and go, yeah, it looks, it looks okay to me. You know, you put the spark plugs back in, and next thing you know, you got an engine failure on takeoff. Or, you know, yeah, that fuel leak is not a problem. I'll just throw a bunch of RPV in there and seal it up. Next thing you know, they're sealing up the uh, drain holes for water, and then you have a, an engine failure due to water. So I agree with you. I just think that there there has got to be a call to action as an industry to police ourselves, but to provide the tools to those professional organizations that can get a better comprehensive look at the people that are operating in and around our aircraft. Yes. Well, you may remember the plea I made to Dennis Mullenberg at Boeing about dealing with the substandard maintenance organizations around the world that are working on his airplane. Yep. I and mean, we'll see if anything comes of that. Yeah. 
Nope. I agree. I agree. I, and that's why I, we go back to that discussion you and I had. And I hope that now because of the 737 MAX issues, I think the industry has gotten a wake up call that the airlines now need to be vetted. If you're going to buy an airplane from a manufacturer, you have to now demonstrate that you have the operational capability, you have the pilots, you have the training programs, you have the oversight, you have the maintenance programs to do it right. Because Lion Air and Ethiopian Air are both two airlines that have demonstrated they didn't have what it took to operate those airplanes. And it's not my saying, it's the facts of the report that were developed by those investigative authorities. And you know what? It's the fact. And I think that it's it's really time that the manufacturers buckle up and buckle down and get these folks on board because, you know, all they do is they lose an airplane and then they want to blame it on the manufacturer and put their pilots as victims. Well, guess what? Pakistan, those two guys, they created their own issue. Yet, you know, they'll find a way to try and blame someone other than themselves. And it's just I, I think it's wrong. It's a disservice to aviation and the professionals that operate in aviation worldwide, not just here in the United States. Well, on that note, Greg, we've hit this one pretty hard. A lot of our opinion in here. So I think we will uh, call it a day and, and start preparing for our next podcast. Well, it's always good to get on a rant with you, John, especially when uh, when we're talking maintenance and everything else. I mean, that's why I miss being in the studio with you. So when you say something ridiculous, I can throw something at you. I can't throw anything at you. I'm going to have to get a virtual... I'm going to have to get a virtual paper wad and throw it at you. Yeah. So, <laughs> but now I, uh, I always enjoy our conversations and I hope that the, uh, the listeners do too. We try to bring some education and perspective to a lot of these complex issues, some of the, you know, misnomers and of course the misinformation that's out there, but we always appreciate your feedback. We do appreciate those folks that have recently contributed to keeping our show alive with their donations. So thank you very much. We're going to start publishing names on our website to, uh, to publicly thank you because uh, it's folks like you who keep John and I motivated to really talk about these issues, bring things to light, and of course, try to have a call to action, if you will, to the appropriate folks or organizations who can make things happen. So you can always contact us at our email at flight safety detectives with an S at gmail.com. Again, we, we always appreciate the feedback, good, bad, and indifferent. We work to, uh, to make the show better. So thank you very much for all your support. And as always, my friend, thank you for uh, indulging me in some of my rants and raves. So, you know, it's nice to be able to vent, especially in this period of COVID where physically and mentally, you know, we're not as challenged every single day, but this is a, a good release because there are so many issues out there that every single day keep developing or keep coming to light. And, and at least you and I can, can talk about it and hopefully educate the folks that are listening. So as always, I will give you the last word. Well, I hope uh, there's any maintenance people out there to take exception to what I said, get a hold of me. I would love to have a discussion. And otherwise, for everybody... Please fly safely. To listen to more episodes of the show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com or the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association at PAMA.org and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Catch us next time when John Golia and Greg Fife talk about all things aviation. Thanks for listening. <laughs>